good. How's everybody doing this morning? Yeah. Oh, that's a lot of stuff. I've heard that in a long time, but shh, there's a baby in the house. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> well, I don't know about you guys, but I'm excited for today. I'm excited for tomorrow. I'm excited for Tuesday because every day is God's day. So it's awesome. But I'm going to have you guys stand up if you can. We can. We can. Thank you, Eric. And we're just going to get ready to praise God because it's what we're here to do. It's an awesome experience and an awesome time to just be in the presence of God. Isn't it? I don't know about you, but I get excited and sorry, Lord, I keep saying that. She gets after me from time to time. I don't know about you. <laughs> but let's just pray. Amen. Let's just lift up to God. Whatever you're going through right now, I want you to not be scared. I want you to be bold. And I'm going to be praying, and this is going to sound a little weird and a little nuts, but you be praying at the same time. If you need to pray out loud, pray out loud. If you need to pray in your head, pray in your head. I'm fine with that. But just pray. Bring whatever you're dealing with before the Lord. Leave it at his feet. Clear your mind of, of any distractions that might be distracting you from what God is trying to do in you. And just submit this time of worship to him. And it gets us ready for what he's going to do. You'll be surprised with what he speaks to you through worship. What he speaks to you through the word of God. What he speaks to you through other people. All right? So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for this opportunity to be in this place, to be focusing our time and our attention on you. Father God, whatever we're going through, I just pray right now that we leave it at the altar, that we take it out of our minds, Father God, whatever it is that's going on, whether it be financial issues, work issues, people within our family, people outside of our family, if it be struggles with, with people at work or, or things going on in our minds and doubts, Lord God, I just pray right now that we leave them at your feet. Let you deal with our issues. God, help us to not worry and fret over those things because we're not even guaranteed tomorrow. You are the only one that knows our future. So Father God, we trust you with that. We give you our future. We give you our today. We give you our now. Father God, I just pray that worship would be this time where we just pour out our hearts to you that we sing praises to you, that we lift you up, not because you necessarily need it. You know how great you are. But sometimes we need to remember just how great of a God we serve. And it helps reaffirm within our hearts and our minds just how great you are. So Father God, I pray that you will speak to our hearts today. That you will speak not just to our emotions, but to who we really are. Yes. Father God, I pray that you will change our hearts and our minds towards you today. We give you praise. Amen.
you know the prayer that's on everyone's heart here, Lord, today. Individually, Lord, the different struggles. Lord, you are our God. Amen. Yeah. And Lord, when we reflect back, and just think about the things you've done in our lives. Oh, God, what a glorious day.
call my name. You call my name. Lord, he calls to you. He brought us close to you. Oh, God, you're so good. And now you're changing our lives. You're doing stuff. You change yeah. the inside out. And uh, you make us new creatures. You're resurrecting us.
declare those words. Lord, you just want so much for us to draw close to you. To stay close to the cross, Lord. That all our glory be in you. All our glory be in the cross. The cross where you died. The cross where you shed your blood. The cross where you took upon you our sin. You bore our sin in your own body. That we should live under righteousness. Thank you, Father God. Lord, call us deeper and deeper into you. Jesus, King, me.
with every head bowed and every eye closed, and have the ushers come forward as they're preparing to take of tithes and offerings. Just want us to take a moment to just be in the presence of God. God, we thank you for what you're doing in this place. We thank you what you're doing within us. Father God, we give you praise in the good things that are, that are taking place in our lives, Lord God. And in the bad things, we see you moving, even, even though the bad things are happening. We see that you want us not to be there. That you want better things for us. So Father God, as, as we prepare our tithes and our offerings, Lord God, I just pray that you will help us to see that our worship of you is more than the offering we give. It's more than the confession that we've made that you are our Savior. It is our life. So Lord God, I pray that today our offering to you is not just what we feel that you have called us to give and, and financially, Lord God, but what you have called us to do as people of Christ. Amen. That we give to you all of who we are our heart, our time, our efforts, our patience. Lord God, that we give them all to you and that you be glorified over us. Yes. God, I pray that you bless the giver. Bless everything that comes in today. Stretch it and use it to do far greater things than we could ever imagine. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Sure mighty God, the Almighty, and all the universe, all created.
Just a statement. There's none like you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that we've been chosen to live within us to be here. Lord, thank you for this fellowship called Al Christian Fellowship. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank you for what you're moving, how you're moving in our lives and what you're doing. Thank you for the Holy Spirit, Lord. We continue to cry out for him, out for him, your Holy Spirit, in such a mighty, mighty way. Not only in ACF, but in the church, all over God. Lord, pour out your spirit by him. And we just thank you, Lord, as Pastor David comes to share the word with us this morning, Lord. May our hearts be open to receive what you have for us. And we just give you thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. That's going to be a hard act to follow. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but that charges you up. That, uh, that gets your blood going. And I'm not just talking about the speed at which that hit, but just the power that is in those words. <sighs> Sorry. I still got goosebumps. Got goosebumps on my goosebumps. We're going to be in Romans chapter old kids. Yes. Thank you. Pastor Lord. <laughs> if you're uh, if you're potty trained to fifth grade, Pastor Laura's got something ready for you guys, and she's going back that way. So have fun. I wish I could color with you guys because it's fun. How many of you guys want uh, adult coloring pages in here? Like like pattern, not get your heads out of gutters, right? You, the nice, cool patterns that, okay. If you want some, I'll make some up. You just got to color them nice. <laughs> if you color out of lines, we're going to have some words, you know. We're going to be in Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 14 today. So if you have your Bibles and you can open those to that. I just have a couple of announcements before we jump into the Word of God. Men, if you are wanting more, you want to go into the Bible and you want to be able to ask questions of other dudes, right? And get their support and be a brotherhood together. We're starting that back up first Saturdays of every month. If you have questions of where that's going to be at and how that's going to happen, come see myself or Larry. Larry, wave your hand in the air and, like you just don't care. That's right. You find one of us, and if you can't find one of us, just turn on the light and you'll be able to find one of us because we'll shine. We will. I'll get hit before Larry does because Larry's above everybody else. So you got to hold that light really high. But we're starting up that men's, men's breakfast. It'll be starting at 7.30 and location. Just come find us. We'll tell you where that's at or check your flyer that we mailed out to you. Um, if you haven't got one of those, just let us know. Also, directly after service, we'll have probably like, I don't want to wait too long. We're probably like four or five minutes. That way we have some time to, if you need to get a drink of water, Use restroom, whatever, and then we'll go right into annual business meeting. I'm making a promise this year, Beth. You can hold me to this. It is going to be under an hour. I promise. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I promise. It's not as long as last year, so uh, just be excited for that. And uh, we'll be talking about the, tr the business of the church from the last year and where we see ourselves going this next year. Now on to the important stuff. Last week we talked about and, and we saw through uh, 7, 1 through 13 that Paul is talking about how believers have been united with Christ. And we're left off, verse 13, it says this, did, uh, did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means, in referring to the law. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. Basically, Paul was explaining and showing us how sin used what God had made as good, the law, to produce sin within us. Does that mean that God made us sin? No. But he used the law to show us just how bad sin was. And this is the point at which Paul picks up and he's going to show us that there are these warring factions within us all. We each have two things fighting in us. And he's going to explain that a little bit more. 
The two natures are distinctly different. We're going to start in verse 14, and we're going to see that there's a conflict within us. For we know that the law, verse 14, we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. That's an interesting statement. Because when we got saved, how many in here, and you can raise your hand, but you can nod, that's fine too, or you at home, you believe that when you got saved, the sin went away. It was no longer there. You didn't have to deal with it. That was my thought process. I'm like, no more sin, woohoo! That didn't prove very well. You've heard the stories of my grandma. She can attach, she's sitting right back there, ask her. I was not a nice person a lot of the time. I got spanked regularly. But sin still lived in us, right? Still does. I don't know of anybody in here that doesn't get agitated at something. Or doesn't not do what they should do. None of us in here obey God 100% of the time. I can say that with supreme confidence. Because we're all human beings. We're all going to make a mistake. We all have. So there's a, conf uh, a confliction between us because the law is spiritual in the fact that the law's purpose was to make us and push us towards Christ and towards God. And it's a good thing. But I am of the flesh sold under sin. So this, this conflict between us, there's two natures. The spirit, which is godliness against the things of the flesh, and then the flesh, which is sin nature, against the things of God. So all of us have this sin nature that we were born with. It's there until we're in the presence of God, which is a good thing. You know why I say it's a good thing? Because it teaches us to be more obedient to God. Nobody wants to be a drone, right? Does anybody in here want to be a drone? You want to be told exactly what to do? If you're like me, you like lists, right? You like knowing, okay, if I do this, and I do this, and I do this, all, everything's going to come out good. But not all of us are good at math, right? You can follow a procedure, but it doesn't mean you're always going to come out with the same answer. Kids, if you have trouble with math, don't ask me. I'll tell you now. I'm bad at it. I can do adding and subtracting, multiplication, I use calculator. If you have math questions, ask Bob. He's a whiz. <laughs> But we have these things fighting within us and a sin nature being there until we're in the presence of God. Amen. That's what we have to deal with. It's there. These two natures are consistently fighting to gain and maintain their position with our being. It's a constant fight. You know, when we're told to put on the full armor of God and we're not just told, like I like to say, we don't just go streaking for Jesus, right? We just don't put on the helmet of salvation and be like a cover and then go outside, right? That would be bad. A lot of us would get arrested, right? If you went outside with nothing on but a hat, you'd get arrested. And rightfully so. Right? We're not just supposed to wear the helmet of salvation. It says put on the full armor of God. Why? Because there are things that are coming at you that you are not going to be able to handle on your own. The armor is spiritual. It's to protect you from those things. Those battles are conflicting around us all the time. They're fighting for control. Now, before we dive into this, I want to take a second to look at the nature so, uh, of the law. There are three different beliefs in, in what the law is defined as. So one is the Mosaic Law, which is the Ten Commandments. We can understand that pretty easy. There's another meaning to the law, which is a moral law, which we can understand right and wrong, right? Most of us can now, here's the difference, just a little sidetrack. In today's society, in today's world, moral law is almost non-existent. In a non-believing world, it is non-existent. Because it's up to the person's own beliefs of what they want to believe is right and wrong, is then picks it. There's no moral to that. For the believer, moral law is set by God. If God says it is good, then it is morally good. If he says it is bad, we stay away from it. Because we're trying to be morally right. We're trying to live by God. So there's part of the law that is moral. And that is also connected with the Ten Commandments. 
when you look at that and you look at the Gospels and you realize that in the Gospels when Jesus says, when he's asked, what are the greatest commandments? And he says, love the Lord your God with all your mind, heart, soul, and spirit. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of a sudden, we start going, wait a second. He said, what's the one commandment? And they gave me two. But he goes, in all, all the other laws, those two things are in control. Love God more than anything else. Amen. Pastor Laura, this morning in, in prayer time, she goes, uh, God, we don't want you to be number one. We want you to be at all. Okay. Essentially, that's what she said. We don't want you to just be number one that gets to fight with number two. We want you to be all of who we are. We want all of you. We want that to just be screaming out of us. That is what the law is trying to do. And then when he says, love your neighbor as yourself, well, you look at the rest of the Ten Commandments. Don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, don't kill. Well, that's pretty loving, right? If you didn't lie to your neighbor, if you didn't cheat your neighbor, if you didn't kill your neighbor, those are pretty good things, right? <laughs> that's loving yourself. Or you're loving your neighbor like you would love yourself, right? If you don't want something to happen to you, why would you do the same very thing to your neighbor? All those things are wrapped into that one thing. God wants us to love each other. Not just accept, but to love. Now the context of the passage that we're referring to here in verse 14 when it speaks of the law, uh, many commentators, as, as well as myself, believe that it's talking mainly about the Mosaic Law and the Ten Commandments, but it's also a connection with moral law. So, for we know that the law is spiritual, but it is, uh, but I am of the flesh, sold into bondage to sin. So, the law of Moses and morally, those laws are right and they're spiritual, because it has to do with who we really are. And when we give our lives to Christ. The Spirit comes back alive. The Holy Spirit comes and He lives within us. And that is a very spiritual thing. One, two, God is Spirit. Nobody in here can say, I've seen God. Usually it's, I see a really bright light. Right? Most of the time we see that. Paul's so bright he gets blinded for three days. Interesting things, right? Read your Bible. It's cool stories. Paul is saying that the Mosaic Law is good and morally right. That it is not simply showing that sin's consequences are bad, but that sin itself is bad. It's not just saying that when you don't follow God and you don't listen to Him, that the consequences are bad. It's showing you that sin in and of itself is bad. God created us for a purpose. Why would we want to do anything else other than doing what God created us to do? But sin has distorted that. Sin has made other things fun, other things great, other things nice, right? It's kind of distracted us from that. And that's what we got from last week, that the sin used the law to distort what was good. It doesn't make the law bad. It makes sin that much worse. God is going through great lengths to show us just how bad sin, how bad sin is. That his law is more than just a physical thing to follow. It's also spiritual. It is meant to keep us in right standing with him. The law not only shows what sin is, but proves to us that we have a sin nature. Amen. The law is in line with God. Amen. You say, well, how can God be in line with his own law? Haven't you ever heard of, of, of the Crusades? People were killing in the name of God. Right? I've heard that. Not everything done in God's name is godly. Right? Just because we say, oh, God told me to do this, doesn't mean God told you to do it, did he? No. What God has called us to do is to love our neighbors, so killing them is not loving. Straightforward, it's not. The law is always in line with God. Why? Because he will not contradict what he says. He will not change what he says when it comes to his rules. He holds us to him. We're sold into bondage to sin, or as the ESV has put it, it puts us sold under sin. Meaning that though we are free from sin's control, we still have to deal with it. Our sin nature is still there, but it does not have the power to control you. That was broken. 
when you gave your life to Christ and you accepted him into your heart, you says, God, I'm changing my thinking, right? Because when we repent, it's changing how we think about God. It's saying, no longer am I going to be willingly disobedient to you, but I'm willingly going to follow you. I'm letting you take control. That's what repent means. You give up who you were and say, I'm going to be who you want me to be from this point on. Some of us have to do that more often than not. I gave my life to Christ when I was a little kid in, in uh, I believe it was Straight Arrows, and my mom was helping lead the Royal Rangers group that, because there was no other leaders. I gave my life then, but guess what? I didn't really give my life to Christ until I got older. Until that made more sense to me. Until it made sense. But I will tell you this, if you're young and you give your life to Christ, mean it with all your heart. Take it serious. It's not that you can. For me, it took me a little while to get it. Verse 15. For I do not understand my actions. Now this is Paul talking. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. Paul is showing his humanness in this. Some say that he's talking about before he gave his life to Christ. Others say that he's actually talking about here and the now. And when we look at it, we can understand just by the language he uses, for I do not uh, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do what I, but I do the very thing I hate. Yeah. Paul is opening up about himself, saying, look at me. Yeah, I am going out, I'm doing the word of God, but there are still times in me that I have struggles. There's still times in me where I do the very thing that I hate. He gives in to that sin. Does that mean it's right? No. He's not opening up saying, yeah, go out and do that thing that you hate. It'll be okay. It's covered by sin. Exactly the opposite. He's showing that he doesn't even know. When you have kids, and you have to, why did you do that? What's the favorite answer they like to say? I don't know. I don't know. Exactly, right? Why did you kick your sister? I don't know. <laughs> why did you throw the ball through the window? I don't know. <laughs> right? We do that as adults even, don't we? Your boss comes in and says, why, why did you do that? Uh, uh, I don't know, right? And he walks away and goes, whew, dodge the bullet, right? Okay, maybe I'm the only one preaching to the choir here. I've done that. I've done that to my parents, I don't know. Get you grounded. <laughs> but Paul is even over he doesn't understand why he does it. He just does it. He shows that there is a conflict within us, that this humanness is, is warring against what God has called us to be. He doesn't really know why he sins at times. What he wants to do is serve God, do as God desires. What he does is the very thing that he hates. His sin takes place. He hates, yet still does. That's convicting. That's very convicting. There have been times in my life where I know what God wants me to do, but I don't want to. And sadly, I have to say, my I don't want to want a lot of times. And I believe wholeheartedly in my heart that if I would have just listened, I would have been in a very better place in my life. It might not be position change, it might not be different, but I would be better for it. Because when you start trusting God just a little bit, it gets easier and easier to just let go of more and more. And all of a sudden, when, when you're standing in that boat and you're being the doubting or Peter, right? Two foot mouth Peter, as I like to call him. He says, Lord, if it's you, come out. Call me out of this boat. All right, come on. Oh. Doesn't say he was chicken. He got out of the boat and walked on water. Then he freaked out, looked around, and started to sink. They got out of the boat. We have to be willing enough to desire all of what God wants. But we have to understand that sin is fighting to get your attention away from Him. It. it is doing its darndest to change your focus. It will do the smallest things and make it seem like it's okay, a little here, a little there, a little lie. A lie is still a lie, regardless of how big or small it is, right? 
If you lie about 10 cents on your taxes, do you think the IRS ain't gonna come after you for 10 cents? It seems a little stupid, but they will, right? Why just let me have my extra nickel or dime, right? A little white lie is still a lie. A little bit of following him is not completely following him, is it? If you're sold out yet holding back, look and see in the Bible what happens to people who tell God one thing and withhold from it. Has a little something to do with dropping dead is one example. Israel, oh, we follow you, we follow you. I don't want to go in there 40 years wandering in the desert. If you're going to be sold out for God, be sold out for God. Don't let these natures in you draw you to something that you're never supposed to, to be in. You have to understand that there's a war. His very actions of doing the sinful things proves that the law is good. Romans 2.1 helps us to see this. Therefore, you have no excuse, O oh man, every one of you who judges. For in passing judgment of another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. Mm -hmm. I have gotten after so many people about foul language, but you know what? I was one of the worst at where I worked at times. I got after people about picking on people. And I was the one picking on my family and on my cousins and on all these other people and in school. I got after people for looking at stuff that they shouldn't have. And I myself was looking at the very same stuff. It's hard. We deal with the very same thing. We need to be careful. We need to understand that there are things going on in our lives and sin that is still trying to control us but we don't have to let it. Verse 17, So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. Paul is not saying that when you sin, that you're off the hook. A lot of us see this and go, okay, well, when I sin, it's not me. It's not really who I am. It's, you know, it's my body doing it. That's stupid, right? Maybe, maybe I'm the only one that thinks so, but that's kind of, that's a dumb excuse. You still did it. You have the ability to say, no, I don't, I'm not going to. You still have the ability to call out God and say, God, take this away from me. So here you are doing it. I've used that excuse before. And that's not what Paul is saying. You have to face your consequences of your action. Just because somebody murdered somebody and was put in jail, just because they said they were sorry, and that they sought forgiveness from God for that, doesn't mean they're off the hook for the consequence, does it? No. Just because you lie to an IRS agent or something on IRS, I'm using taxes because it's close, right? Just because you lie on your taxes about something and you're like, oh, sorry, you know, I did that. I'm sorry. Does that get you off the hook? You still owe it, right? Or the time. <laughs> and the fine. And the this and the that, right? Just because you do something doesn't mean you're off the hook. Because we are responsible for what our flesh does. We are responsible for our actions. This won't change the fact that Jesus' death covers the sin and you're forgiven, but you are now accountable to your disobedience to God. We need to see sin as believers as exactly what it is, disobedience to God. Amen. When you do that thing that you know you're not supposed to, when you don't do that thing you know you're supposed to, you're being disobedient to God. Not being disobedient to Pastor David, you're not being disobedient to your boss, well, you might be, you're ultimately being disobedient to God. That should weigh hard on us. Not just for us to be like Judas who sought forgiveness, I'm sorry, but to actually change how we think about things again. Because it's really easy for us to slip back into that same old rut, right? we got to take it to God. Allow Him to change us. Don't just try to follow the law on your own. Seek God. He is the only one that's going to help you be able to follow what He's called you to do. Amen. He's the only one. Sin may no longer be in the driver's seat. 
but that doesn't stop him from grabbing the wheel from time to time. Right? I can attest to this. Sorry, Mom, I'm going to use you as an example. There are times in my early driving years where she would be riding with us. She wouldn't grab the wheel, but it was, you know, Mom's, mom's intuition, right? Or put the hand up. I'm like, Mom, that car is 14 car lengths ahead of us. What are you worrying about, right? That's still, right? It's still that knee jerk. The devil is still going to grab at your wheel. He's still going to grab at who's driving your life. You can't let it. Now that sounds hard, well, how do you beat the enemy? You fight him with the spirit. What did God do when, when Satan was tempting him in the, in the desert for 40 days? He quoted scripture to him. He reminded him of just who he was and who he is. Satan knows scripture. He does. He will even use it to try and deter you and change your mind. Remember Adam and Eve? Did he really say? Trying to change man from trusting God to doubting God. And it worked. It's just that simple still today. We have to come to a place in our life where we can and will admit that there is nothing good about our flesh. And I'm not just talking about our physical body, but sin nature. There's nothing good about it. So we're faced with a struggle. Verse 18. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do... Okay, here's a tongue twister. Verse 19. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do want is what I... The evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Verse 20, now if I do what I do not want, it's no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. Tongue twister. Say that one four times fast. For the believer, the struggle to faithfully follow God is not without faults. We have to understand we're natural. We've got to mess up. There are going to be times where who we are isn't going to cut it. But trust God. Since our sin nature is still part of us, we face the challenge to live for God. We desire to do what is right in the eyes of God, but our ability to do so is what causes the issue. We tend to fight the urges of the flesh with our own flesh. Right? I'm going to, I'm going to tattle on myself. I'm on a diet. And Laura made these cookies. It's not her fault. It's not her fault. It's my fault. And they're sitting on the counter. And you know how hard it is to fight a cookie with your flesh when you know you probably shouldn't? You're already, you're already up to here full. And you can already kind of feel, I don't know about you guys, I get acid reflux, but you kind of feel it. And you're like, ooh, cookie. <laughs> it's just that easy. And then you deal with heartland the rest, the rest of the night and in the morning, and it's not fun. When we try to fight off our sin nature with our flesh, we're going to lose a lot of the time. Because it's weak. It really is. Our ability, our ability tells us to try harder to live right. Doesn't it? If I would just try harder, we hear that from coaches, right? If you just try a little harder next time. I heard that from my football coach. I'm not saying anything bad about coaches because we need to hear that. And a lot of times it's because the kids aren't trying hard enough, right? If we're being real. But within our life, we don't need to try harder. We need to trust God. Let him do it. Let him do the work. When you ask him for something, be willing and ready to listen and do what he says. A lot of times that's where we mess up. God, I want help with this. Can you help me? Can you help me? Can you help me? Oh, I need a job. I need a job. I need a job. All of a sudden, a job off my... I'm not that one, though. Right? Just listen to God. 
because you're better off with it. We take that diet approach, trying to force results out of our own merit. Wasn't that what the Pharisees did? When you look at it, weren't the Pharisees just trying to follow God as best they could? Was that not why they made up a bunch of other laws? Mm -hmm. To make sure that they didn't mess up? Yet they're missing the whole point, which is to listen to him, to follow him, to do what he says. The law being spiritual in nature means that we will need more than our physical efforts to live it out. Mm -hmm. We need God's help. The will of the Spirit is not causing the issue, but rather my lack in fighting against my sin nature while abiding in Christ. The Spirit in us ain't, ain't having the issue. We are. Our willpower, our ability to say no, that's the issue. We don't want to admit that there is an issue, so we try to fight the good fight, and yet we lose. All the while, the good, uh, all the while God is saying, come to me and I will help you. When Peter was sinking in the water, what did he say? Whoa, whoa, whoa. Right? <laughs> Sorry, I had to make it funny. But what does Jesus do? Grabs him by the hand, pulls him out, and the back of the boat. Reach out. Grab a hold of him. Many times when we're going through that stuff, we fail to realize because we're so ashamed, right? Adam, Eve, where are you? They hid themselves. If we were in sin, we would just run to God. If we're having struggles with this, run to God. He's going to be like a good father. Will it hurt sometimes? Yeah, it hurts sometimes to admit that you've been wrong. But go to him. He's there to help you. Verse 21. So I find it to be a law that when I, when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Our sin nature lives in us, even though God has changed our inner man or who we think or, or how we think God has changed our minds. The solution, verse 22, for I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul speaking of this inner being or this inner man is the rational way of thinking and not the flesh of, of our physical body that delights in the law. Remember, when you have repented, you have changed how you think about God. When up here is connected with God and that's all you can think about, you're going to trust him a lot more. It's going to be harder for the enemy to change how your body reacts. Why? Because you have beaten your body into submission. Now, I'm not saying you go home and punch yourself four times when you sin. That's not what I'm saying. But when your mind is so focused on God and you put so much time and energy into putting your attention on him, you ain't got time for other things, one. And the things that you do have time for, you're going to be so excited to share about what God's doing in your life, what God's doing in your family, what God's doing to you or showing you that it's just going to spill out and pour out. And when that happens, worlds are changed. Communities are changed. Families are changed. Who we are changes. Thanks be to Christ that we're saved. And that through him, we can see that though we're going to face stuff, we can do it. Because it's through him. The law makes sense in our mind. We see why, uh, why he would say, have no other gods but me. Why we should commit adultery. Why we shouldn't kill each other. Why we shouldn't do all those things. We see those as good, right? If we don't, there's some things I need to talk to you about. <laughs> right? But we see those things as good. We know that they're right. 
So why do we have such a hard time breaking them? Because sin fights against us. He also recognizes that there is another law waging a war against the law of the mind, which is making him captive to the law of sin. We can't just pretend that there is no sin nature in us. We have to realize that it's there and allow God to make the changes. We are different once we've been saved and forgiven, but Paul reminds us that we are still wretched. Paul, this great apostle who shared the gospel over continents and shared it with, I'm guessing, has reached millions and millions of people. We today can count back to Paul's gospel being shared. He's the best evangelist. He's greater than Billy Graham. Right? We see the evangelists. There's Billy Graham, there's us, and there's Paul. But he himself even says he is wretched. He knows it and is trying to inform us salvation is not a means to an end of all struggles, but that is the solution to solving the problem. Christ is the solution. Sin has no power. Through Christ, sin has no power over us. Sin can no longer make you do what it desires. You have the choice to resist it. Which are you going to choose? Verse 25b, this is just the second half of 25. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. As Christians, we have to stop trying to do it on our own. We have to be like Paul, submitting our mind to the law of God. And when sin happens, acknowledge it for what it is and run to the Father. Don't just say, I give up and continue. Run to Him. I speak from experience. It's not fun, but it's beneficial. I'm going to have you bow your heads and close your eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we just thank you for this time. God, I pray that my words were not confusing. God, I pray that you will reach the heart of the listener. Amen. Father God, we trust that you have the best things for us. That you want the best things to happen in our lives. And I'm not just talking about giving us cool things or anything like that. But God, that we trust you so much that we see amazing things happen. That we can give you glory in everything that we do. Whether it be making a cake for our kids on our birthday, Lord God, or it just be something grand like being able to see somebody healed on a football field that's gotten hurt. God, we put all of our faith and our hope and our trust in you. That you will call out the sin in our life, that we will see it for what it is, and that we submit to you and give ourselves over to you for the correction and then for our walking forward. Father God, help us to see you as a loving Father, one that cares more about us than anything else in this world. That you would leave those that you're with to go after the one that is lost. That you would be like the Father in the parable of the forgotten or the prodigal son that stands there daily looking out and praying for his child to come back home. Mm -hmm. God, for us in here that are dealing with struggles and issues of, of knowing where we're supposed to be, of knowing that we're living and doing things that we know we're not supposed to be doing, Father God, I pray that you help us to realize that it is far better in your house, that it's far better in your presence. Lord God, help us to come to you, bring those and lay them at your feet. Seek your forgiveness. And then we change our thinking. Lord God, that you allow you to make us new. That we will not submit to our flesh, but that we will resist it. And that when it is hard for us to resist it, and we know we're going to have issues with that, that we trust you, that we ask you for those answers, and then that we listen to them. God, we want you to speak. We want you to live. We want you to be in us at all times. Help us in that, I pray. Amen. 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 I want to remind you one little thing. This is pretty consistent.
consistent through all of, of the chapter 7. Just because you are free does not mean you're free from conflict. But you have somebody to call to. You can trust God. God bless you guys. Amen. In about five minutes, five, ten minutes, we'll start the, uh, the annual board meeting. I'll give a light flick for you, and we'll be done pretty quick. Okay? God bless you guys. Amen. Thank you.